Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the ninth lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the horse. We're going to cover the nervous system, and we're going to throw the eyes in here, too. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank some friends and colleagues who provided me these fantastic images over the years that allow me to put this lecture series together. As I like to start with the young animals, we'll start with a couple of developmental anomalies of the nervous system in the horse. This is a very complex and uncommon anomaly of the brain. It's known as holoprosencephaly with secondary arinencephaly. Now those are very long words. What they mean is that the cerebrum has not split into two hemispheres. So holoprosencephaly means a single entire prosencephalon, which is the front part of the brain. The arinencephaly part means that we don't have the projection that is normally associated with the front of the brain, the rinencephalon. This developmental anomaly of the brain usually accompanies or even drives the cyclopean malformation. Cyclops are, are seen most commonly in ruminants who graze certain types of plants like false hellebore or veratrum californicum, which impedes the division if they're ingested between 12 to 16 days of age. But you can see Cyclops in any species, from humans all the way on down. It is generally a mutation which involves the sonic hedgehog gene, which is responsible for a key signaling molecule in early forebrain induction in mammals. All the other things that we see associated with Cyclops follow this change. Okay. Um, the development of the single eye parallels the uh, failure of the brain to split. The single eye is not truly a single eye in this malformation. It is a combination of the two eyes. It's more properly termed synophthalmus than cyclopia. You'll also see marked craniofacial abnormalities associated with this because, you know, everything is going on at once during development. So the brain develops in this particular fashion. You have resultant abnormal development of the optic cups as well as the skull. Note the absence of the longitudinal cerebral fissure rostral to the optic chiasm, which is here as well as the absence of the olfactory bulbs and peduncles, which normally are the anterior aspect of the brain. Let's look at a couple of other developmental abnormalities in the horse. One of the places in the brain that you see a lot of malformations is in the cerebellum. We see these not uncommonly in certain breeds, such as Arabians, and as you can see here, the cerebellum, especially the vermis, is malformed and sort of twisted. This would be referred to as Arabian cerebellar dysplasia. Um, but most of them cause minimal problems. The wiring still works, and there's just an abnormal gross appearance of the, uh, of the cerebellum. But let's look at a couple of cerebellar defects that will have profound effects upon the animal. Here is a severe defect that can be seen in foals and calves called the Arnold Chiari-like malformation. This is a dysplasia of the occipital lobes and the cerebellum, which actually results in their displacement backwards through the foramen magnum. You can see here, if the foramen magnum is here, the occipital lobes and the cerebellum have been pushed through the uh, abnormal openings in the skull. The cerebellum 
has been pushed all the way, and it's dysplastic and very small as well, so it's pushed all the way through the frame and magnum into the area of the atlas. And the occipital lobes are pushed backwards into the area where the cerebellum is supposed to be. This malformation usually results in complete obstruction of the flow of cerebrospinal fluid and resulting hydrocephalus within the cerebrum. So as a review, the hydrocephalic cerebrum is within the skull. The occipital lobes are where the cerebellum should be and the cerebellum is back outside the skull proper through the foramen magnum. Another significant malformation of the cerebellum has been documented in foals, and this is the Dandy Walker-like malformation, which results in total absence of the cerebellar vermis. All you have left is the meninges over the top. The lateral hemispheres and the peduncles are still intact, but the vermis is totally gone. The dandy walker-like malformation. Now, here is a cerebellum that is smaller than normal. It doesn't even fill the cranial fossa, and it looks sort of floppy and, and uh, fallen into itself. And that is because uh, you have a significant loss of gray matter and white matter. This is a form of uh, cerebellar abiotrophy. The cerebellum is normally formed properly. Then over time, uh, you will have a loss of Purkinje cells and granular cells from the cerebellar folia. Uh, this is an autosomal recessive uh, disease that is most well known once again in Arabians and Arabian mixes, but has also been documented in Swedish Gotlands and the American miniature horse. This condition uh, starts between birth and six months. The animals uh, are, that are affected appear normal at birth and then sometimes between six weeks and six months. Uh, they start to uh, have loss of these cells. The first thing that's seen is sort of a head tremor, um, which progresses to a full-on intention tremor, and then eventually ataxia and a loss of equilibrium. Uh, cerebellar abiotrophy is much better known in uh, dogs. And if you look at the Wednesday slide commerce, we probably have one or two uh, uh, submissions of this every year and it shows up about every other year. I don't know if we've ever had a horse case in the Wednesday Slide Conference, but there's a lot of great information if you check out cerebellar abiotrophy. There are a number of different uh, syndromes associated with this based on what type of cells disappear first. So cerebellar abiotrophy in horses associated with Arabians. Okay. We are looking at the brain of a foal that was contracted when delivered. All of the limbs were poorly, uh, poorly. the musculature was not developed, the limbs were frozen in place in an abnormal location, so-called crooked foals. And if you're having trouble getting oriented on this particular slide, the top of the cranium has been removed. We are looking down into the cranium here is the cerebellum, here is the brainstem, and there is pretty much nothing of the cerebrum. This is a condition that is known as hydranencephaly. It is most often seen in viral infections which infect the brain at a very, very specific point. Um, during development, some viruses will affect the periventricular germinal layer of cells. These cells line the ventricles and they pretty much develop into 
all of the neurons and glial cells and populate the rest of cerebrum. But if a virus comes in and it causes necrosis in that in a very specific early phase of development, the cerebrum and neocortex will not develop. And we, res we end up with a lesion that looks like this. This is hydranencephaly, which means that the neocortex has not developed. Um, there are less severe parts of this called porencephaly, and then the least severe would probably be a, a bad case of hydrocephalus ex vacuo. This is much better known in ruminants, um, where we have a number of uh, viruses, including uh, the blue tongue Orbeez virus, uh, Schmallenberg viruses, Cache Valley Ieno uh, viruses. Uh, so the Bunya viruses, the Orbe viruses um, will do this. It's not common in foals. Uh, the only one that I am familiar with that might cause this um, would be equine eastern encephalitis, which has been uh, identified as doing this in very rare cases. Note that the cerebellum and the brainstem are intact. So this is hydranencephaly and usually a severe manifestation of neurologic and viral infection. Let's talk about some other viruses that affect the nervous system in horses. I like to when I classify the viruses affecting the nervous system, I like to, to break them down into viruses that attack primarily the white matter, viruses that attack primarily the gray matter, and some that attack both. Um, when we look at viruses whose effects primarily affect the white matter in the horse, it really is only one and that is equine herpes virus type 1. Can rarely be caused, spinal damage like this can rarely be caused by equine herpes virus 4. Some people say it's the same thing, but uh, equine herpes virus type 1 is a virus whose lesions are primarily the result of a vasculitis and thrombosis. It occurs in the white matter and you get areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. Now, if you're going to look at this histologically, um, Good luck with that because you rarely, if ever, will find the inclusions as something that is much better uh, identified either by immunohistochemistry or PCR uh, because it can be very unrewarding. But one of the things that you see is that the hemorrhages are almost exclusively in the white matter. There's a very large area of hemorrhage and infection that uh, you have some effect of the gray matter here, but the majority of these cases, you stick with the white matter. So that makes it pretty easy. Um, when we talk about neurologic disease due to equine herpes virus 1, it is much more common, the lesions are much more frequent, much more common in the spinal cord, although you may see small foci of hemorrhage in the meninges as well as the brain. Um, as we talked previously, uh, pregnant mares and nursing foals are predisposed to develop this disease. And remember, like all neurotropic alpha herpes viruses, the animal can become infected, show minimal signs, and then later on, because the virus goes into latent periods in uh, trigeminal ganglia, a number of ganglia, as well as T cells, in periods of stress um, or maybe high doses of steroids, or concurrent disease, it can be reactivated. The, the, because it affects the spinal cord, the lesions are most commonly ataxia and paresis that are most severe in the pelvic limb. You can also see vasculitis outside of the spinal cord and the central nervous system uh, in the eye, where it will result in a uveal vasculitis and optic neuritis in foals. And in stallions, rarely, um, you can find uh, a vasculitis in the testis or the epididymis. But you're looking for areas in the spinal cord of hemorrhage and malacia, um, which are based on a necrotizing vasculitis. This is a fantastic picture uh, by Dr. Fabio Del Piero. And 
I usually don't like to look at uh, longitudinal sections, especially grossly, of the spinal cord, but this is a fantastic picture of a virus that really doesn't care about the white matter, but it does lay waste to the gray matter. And this is West Nile, Nile virus, a virus that uh, we had a huge outbreak in the U.S. Um, from 1999 to 2004. This is one that, that veterinary pathologists had a, a very profound role because the initial outbreak was identified as West Nile virus. A lot of the uh, uh, even CDC had identified this as uh, Japanese encephalitis and the, the pathologist at the Bronx Zoo, Dr. Tracy McNamara, um, said no, that's not correct, this is West Nile virus. It turned out to be uh, uh, West Nile virus, which goes through a bird mosquito bird cycle and really is devastating to birds. But uh, there are a number of dead end hosts, of which horses are one and uh, humans are another, having been bitten by the mosquitoes. Culex mosquitoes are the most important vectors. When we look at the disease in horses, horses are extremely susceptible and there can be up to 50 percent mortality when this virus isn't is uh, uh, introduced to a naive population of uh, the lesions primarily are seen as a non-separative encephalitis or myelitis in the brainstem and the thoracolumbar spinal cord um, with the with the virus and the the death and glial nodules seen primarily within the gray matter, sparing the white matter. Remember to look at the thoracic or the lumbar spinal cords, especially the spinal intumescences, if you want to identify the lesion and ultimately identify the viral agent. Histologically, you'll see lymphoplasmacytic meningomyelitis, so there will be a lymphoplasmacytic meningitis which will extend down into the cord along virchow robin spaces. You'll see extensive perivascular cuffing and then uh, neuronal degeneration, necrosis with glial nodule formation. Uh, the disease itself is not, the histologic appearance is not that different from many other viral infections, but the location of the lesion is. There are a, a couple of other uh, viral agents that you want to think about when you are thinking about uh, uh, gray matter. Something affects the gray matter. Rabies would certainly be one. Um, and then another differential for this particular lesion, a great case that was in the Wednesday slide conference probably about a decade ago, was uh, an animal that was in dorsal recumbency for a long surgery and a very uncommon uh, sequela to uh, recumbency in horses is severe congestion and hemorrhage of the gray matter um, and it's a, a striking lesion with hemorrhage confined and outlining the gray matter so if you have access to Wednesday slide conference which everybody does because they're online I will go back and look at that it's a great one and a uh, unusual uh, but very valid rule out for a viral infection of the gray matter finally there are some agents that really like both we're going to look at that in a minute uh, equine protozoal myelitis doesn't really care where it turns up um, a protozoal agent and we're going to talk about that about that in just a minute, so I'm not going to talk about that at this time. Let's move on from some of the viral agents to bacterial infections of the central nervous system. And this could either be a commentary on how much brain a horse really needs, but I'm not going to say that because uh, I'm going to get myself in Dutch with all of the horse owners out there. We're looking at a cross section through the, and if you look, you look at this, hopefully you can tell where you are. This is the rhinencephalon. 
on these this is very anterior part of the brain it is probably in the olfactory lobes you can see that there is a large abscess within the brain um, so we're in the anterior part of the brain this might have come up through the cribriform plate um, and when you see a large abscess like this one of the things that you want to think about uh, in horses is strep equi variant equi or bastard strangles we've talked about this before about 20 per 20% of cases of strangles in the horse which normally gravitates toward the submandibular and cervical lymph nodes ruptures and drains 20% will go systemic they can go anywhere in the area of those lymph nodes they can go into the guttural pouch they can go uh, up through the frame and magnum and affect the hind brain but they can also go up through the cribriform plate and this is probably there's a chance this could have come in through the blood vessels you will see abscesses and lymph nodes throughout the body so it can get into the bloodstream so um, I can't tell you which way this came but it's a huge abscess and I'm gonna think about uh, strep equi at the top of my list could have been some others sure in a, a young foal I would have to not a young foal but uh, four to six months of age I probably have to consider an atypical presentation of rhodococcus equi um, which can do this as well but strep equi is, equi is going to be at the top of my list for a large abscess such as this one one other bacterial agent that I'm going to mention that causes neurologic disease is Clostridium tetani. This is a very old but an excellent picture of the manifestation of the toxin secreted by Clostridium tetani, which is known as tetanospasmin. Tetanospasmin inhibits the uh, presynaptic release of glycine. Um, in a special population of cells called Renshaw cells. Renshaw cells are intermediate neurons which terminate on lower motor neurons and prevent them from firing. The normal instinct of our lower motor neurons is to fire all the time, but they're prevented by the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter of glycine in these Renshaw cells. But what the uh, what tetanospasm does is it binds to the presynaptic terminal and it prevents them from inhibiting the constant firing of the loader motor neurons and so we have persistent contraction of all the, the lower motor neurons the disease in the horse usually starts in the uh, in the front of the animal and moves backwards so before you see the legs involved before you see the uh, the rib muscles involved which ultimately will kill that animal because that is why animals die of tetanus they're unable to breathe um, you will see these very specific changes in the face of horses you'll also see them in people with tetanus or any affected animal and you see the contraction of the facial muscles so you'll see the lips drawn back um, in humans they call that the sardonic smile of tetanus you will see the nostrils flare the ears if you could see them would be drawn back and these eyes have this really surprised look um, so clostridium tetani tetanospasm and the symptoms are pretty much the same in any animal species okay um, I did want to mention a uh, uh, a protozoal agent, an apicomplexin or coccidian, which causes significant disease in the horse. It generally uh, affects the spinal cord, but you can see it in the brain as well. And this is a apicomplexin known as Sarcocystis neurona. Although identical lesions have been seen occasionally in a couple of other uh, AP complexins, including Neospora caninum and Neospora husei in the horse. Um, the condition is called equine protozoal myeloencephalitis, and you will see uh, you will see hemorrhage and necrosis both in the white matter and the gray matter. It's usually seen in young horses between one and six 
uh, years of age, and the highest incidence is seen in thoroughbreds, quarter horses, and standard breds. It doesn't mean all that much to me because those are probably the three most common uh, breeds of horses that we have uh, in the U.S. The, uh, it is, the horse is an uh, intermediate host, um, and you can see cysts of this in a wide variety of, of wild and domestic herbivores. The definitive host are possums. So horses are, they are dead end hosts. They're not going to uh, transmit the disease, but they can develop severe neurologic disease. The apicomplexin parasite is confined to the CNS and the horse, uh, spinal cord and brain. The cysts can be found in both uh, neurons and inflammatory cells in the CNS. So you can see them in glial cells as well. And it's sort of interesting because they cause these hemorrhagic necrotizing lesions, but the parasites themselves are extravascular parasites, unlike herpes viruses, which uh, infect endothelial cells. This, it's a slowly developing disease. The ataxia, as opposed to herpes virus, is often asymmetric. And in long-standing cases, you will see focal muscle atrophy um, as a result of lower motor neuron function loss to particular muscles in these animals. So this is uh, a good example of a parasite which will affect and cause hemorrhage necrosis both in the white matter and in the gray matter. A gross differential force, this, another uh, uncommon condition that causes lesions in both the gray and the white matter would be embolism of disc material. Uh, when disc rup discs rupture, um, they often rupture with significant force and there's some very large venous plexes um, which sit on top of the disc and sometimes this disc material will go up into the venous plexes and then will be showered down into adjacent segments of the spinal cord. Um, this is not a difficult diagnosis because you have widespread malacia which is very segmental within the spinal cord, just affects one area. The animals become uh, very paretic over a period of time, extremely a short period of time, extremely ataxic. And then at necropsy, because they are a potential source of damage to everyone around them, when they're put down and you look at the areas of, the, the affected areas of spinal cord, you will see this amphiphilic grayish material resulting in thrombosis. Around the vessels, there will be a lot of necrosis, uh, white matter or gray matter, and within the vessels, you will see uh, disc material. It is intensely PAS positive or Alshin blue positive. It's not a difficult uh, diagnosis, but a pretty rare occurrence. So something else that causes lesions. So that's how I do it. White matter lesions, gray matter lesions, and uh, various diseases that don't respect either. Well, that was, a, that was an AP complexum. Let's look at a helmet parasite that will cause uh, disease within the spinal cord. And one of the ones that we see in the horse, um, and there are cases almost every year in the Wednesday Slide Conference, um, is a very interesting nematode that goes by the name of Halocephalobus gingivalis. It's had a lot of names over the years. It's been uh, Halocephalobus delatrix. It's been uh, Nosema delatrix. And somebody said, well, Nosema is already a parasite of bumblebees, so we have to change it back to Halocephalobus. And then somebody said, well, you know, the lesions actually start in the gingiva. And if you go back to the, uh, uh, to the GI lecture, I think the first one, I showed you a picture of the lesion it causes in the gingival crevice when it first infects. Um, the, there are a lot of in, very interesting things about this particular parasite. Uh, for example, the females are parthenogenetic, which means you'll never find a male 
uh, in any of the lesions associated with halocephalobus, um, you'll never find a male. So, a lot is not known about this particular parasite. Uh, it is a free-living parasite that is often seen in decaying vegetation or manure. Um, and it's thought that maybe there is uh, free-living males um, and the copulation occurs before um, the animals exposed to these parasites in the, in the leaf matter or the manure. Um, there is invasion. You can see that it in, invade in a number of different organs in through the mouth, in through the nostrils, resulting in granulomas inflammation in the nose, or even in through wounds or the prepuce. Um, it migrates only along nerves, which is very interesting. So um, it migrates along nerves and ends up in various parts of the body. If it comes in through the nose, it can end up in at the base of the brain, and you'll see large areas of granulomatous inflammation within the brain, which contain adult females and larvae, but no males have ever been identified. Uh, it is a popular one. It's a slide conference contribution. You'll see it in multiple different uh, uh, areas of the body, uh, adrenal glands, uh, testes, just about anywhere that these uh, uh, adult worms are able to move through the tissues and get to by the way of the uh, of the nerves. It's a good way uh, to get into the brain because the blood-brain barrier stops many uh, different agents, but uh, the blood-brain barrier is, per is penetrated by a number of nerves, so they have exploited this way to get into the brain. Okay, um, I've said two things wrong, you know, and sometimes I, I think about these, and, and two things wrong, i got to correct myself on this. Uh, I make mistakes like everybody else. It is not neural. They don't migrate along nerves. They migrate along vessels. I think that's the most important one. And the earlier name was not nosema. It was micronema, but it's not used anymore, so... Um, Nosema was a, a very temporary name for encephalidozoan cuniculi. For a little while it was Nosema cuniculi, and then it got changed back to encephalidozoan. It's a problem with been doing this for so long. I've got so many names in my head, and I always have to think, oh, is that the current name? So, uh, Halocephaloba gingivalis, formerly Halocephalobus delatrix, and perivascular migration gets it into a bunch of interesting parts of the body. We're going to look at it again when we get to the urinary tract because it causes a very characteristic uh, gross lesion in the kidneys. Okay, let's move on to uh, some toxins. This is an absolutely fantastic picture um, from Dr. John King of moldy corn poisoning, also known as leucoencephalomalacia in the horse. And it, it, it demonstrates a bunch of fantastic uh, concepts about this disease. Okay, so moldy corn poisoning, or leucoencephalomalacia, is caused by a toxin known as fumonisin B1. It is produced in moldy corn or grain contaminated with a saprophyte which used to be known as Fusarium maniliforme, but now goes by the name Fusarium verticelloides. Uh, the toxins that it produce um, are called fumonisin, and there are a number of them. There's actually six, A1 and A2 and B1, 2, 3, and 4. Only B1 and B2 appear to be toxic, and fumonisin B1 is the one that causes this particular lesion. It's funny, they named, they changed the name of the uh, fungus to verticelloides, but the toxin remains fumonisin. Okay, so 
couple of things that I want to point out in this particular picture. Number one, there are areas of yellowing with, that are restricted to the white matter and an area of hemorrhage that outlines the white matter. This is a disease of white matter. And you can tell that there is malacia or necrosis of the white matter in this or any other brain with a similar condition because of the yellow color. Remember when you have inflammation of the white matter, there is necrosis and there is an infiltration of macrophages, which will go and gobble up all the myelin, which is 95% fat. And when you oxidize fat, you see it, it, it becomes yellow. It changes from a white color to a yellow color. So whatever you see a yellow plaque in a blood vessel, you want to think about atherosclerosis. So anytime you oxidize fat, it turns yellow. And so one of the classic lesions of this particular disease is the yellow streaking within the white matter. Now, fumonisin doesn't do anything to white matter. It doesn't care about white matter. It doesn't know about white matter. What fumonisin does is inhibit sphingolipid biosynthesis um, in the endothelial cells of the white matter. And this results in death of endothelial cells and thrombosis of the white matter. This is why this beautiful picture of the hemorrhage outlining the white matter is so classic for this disease. We have infarction. We have death of the oligodendrocytes, which care and wrap themselves around the, the, uh, the myelinated nerves and ultimately death of those axons. Getter cells come in to clear it, clean it up, cause denaturation of the myelin that they gobble up and a yellow color. It all fits together very nicely. Fumonisin B1 causes two syndromes in, in uh, uh, horses. This is the acute syndrome. Older horses are more susceptible. Um, initially, they show lethargy and depression, and then eventually, as the brain lesion becomes more severe, they develop ataxia, blindness, circling head pressure, all, all of the, uh, uh, the classic neurologic symptoms. Uh, in chronic cases, um, you will see lesions that resemble aflatoxicosis with uh, marked liver changes, uh, perhaps progressing to cirrhosis. You will see a proliferation of the bile ducts and extreme fibrosis of the portal areas which encroach upon the adjacent hepatic parenchyma. Um, in other species, it may cause other things. In pigs that get into this, it causes severe pulmonary edema. In rats, it's a potent hepatocarcinogen and renal carcinogen, and also will cause marked neovascularization of the lung with hydrothorax, similar to what's seen in pigs. So, but fumonisin B1 toxicosis, leukoencephalomalacia, in the horse and a great great lesion and a great picture another toxic plant that will or another toxin which comes from a plant um, or several plants in the horse uh, results in a classic lesion of vasculitis and encephalomalacia of this region, region at the base of the brain, which uh, encompasses the globus pallidus and the substantia nigra, this being the globus pallidus. Um, the agents that cause this in the United States are yellow star thistle, Centauria solstitialis, and Russian knapweed, Centauria repens, which grow in dry, weedy pastures in the far west, California and Colorado, respectively. It has a, um, the presence of repin has, is the toxic agent and causes a very specific lesion of hemorrhage and necrosis. We, the name of the disease is uh, nigropallidal 
encephalomalacia, which is sort of a combination of the substantia nigra and the global globus pallidus. But usually, nigro pallidal is, is sort of a made-up thing because those are two distinct areas of the brain. You usually don't get necrosis in both. But that's fine. Nigro pallidal and encephalomalacia due to yellow star thistle and Russian napweed. Okay, so what is important here is the focal bilaterally symmetrical nature of this hemorrhage as a small tangent and I'm all full of small tangents whenever you see something that is bilaterally symmetrical um, these are generally either toxic diseases or nutritional diseases that affect a very specific population of cells so whenever I think bilaterally symmetrical lesions I'm thinking is it toxic is it nutritional this is a toxic one and The neurons of the striatal, ni striatal nigral tracts are involved in dopamine metabolism. Repin not only inhibits dopamine release, but also causes glutathione depletion and increased numbers of, in of reactive oxygen species. These neurons usually as a byproduct of dopamine metabolism um, already produce a lot of reactive oxygen species and the toxin that is in these plants probably just push them over the edge resulting in necrosis and hemorrhage. These are also the uh, the pathways that are damaged in Parkinson's disease in humans and the lesion that is associated with repin toxicosis in horses is very similar to Parkinsonism in humans. You see severe depression, you see uh, sort of a somnolent difficult difficulty in movement, um, persistent chewing movements, difficulty in prehension or getting food, uh, dysphagia, and, and a fixed facial expression syndromes that are shared by a number of types of Parkinsonism in people is because the same neurons are affected. One other uh, uncommon rule out because of its geographic restriction to the to New Caledonia in the South Pacific would be Goman disease which causes a pigmentary chain, change in the uh, in this part of the brain. But in the US especially if you're dealing with hemorrhage and necrosis, I'm going to think about yellow star thistle and Russian napweed intoxication. Nigropalatal encephalomalacia. A very common incidental finding that we see in all sorts of old horses and usually is associated with no toxicity is the formation of cholesterol granulomas, some people call them cholesteatomas, within the ventricles of the brain. They are most commonly found in the choroid plexus, affecting the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, um, then the third ventricle, then the lateral ventricles. Um, the development's not totally worked out, um, but it is probably uh, the result of intermittent, intermittent congestion and hemorrhage in the choroid plexus. And what happens over time is that those extravasate erythrocytes get into the choroid stroma, they break down um, and form cholesterol crystals, hematoidin, and uh, they are gobbled up by macrophages. And this happens over and over again, and you have the formation of many small granulomas and then a large granuloma to, to bind them all together. It's a, it's a granuloma formed of many smaller granulomas and the presence of cholesterol crystals. The negative relief spicular uh, uh, points is what gives it its name. These can become absolutely massive in the uh, uh, lateral ventricles such as this, whereas most people think, oh, this doesn't cause any problems. When you get something like that, you're going to have hydrocephalus and obstructive CSF flow. But the vast majority of what we see that we see um, don't cause any problem. You also see them in older bears 
and there is a disease that is seen in humans and hamsters of all species, also called uh, cholesterol granulomas. But these uh, arise in the epithelium lining the uh, very innermost portions of the lateral or vertical ear canals and the epithelium lining the outside of the eardrum. Can cause problems, can cause rupture of the eardrum, but uh, a very different disease than the typical cholesterol or cholesterolic granulomas, which are seen in the brain of horses. As we wind up the uh, diseases of the spinal cord, I want to, to uh, certainly, or of the central nervous system, I want to bring up another uh, disease that has been seen in horses over the years many times, and nobody really knows the actual trigger for this. We are looking at the cauda equina, and you can see that the spinal nerves arising from the cauda equina are very thickened. Um, even the meninges are somewhat fibrotic. And cauda equina neuritis is a progressive granulomatous sclerosing and demyelinating disease uh, which affect peripheral nerves in the horse primarily of the cauda equina, uh, usually affecting the extradural portions of the nerve roots of the cauda equina, but you can see it occasionally in cranial nerves as well, but it never really gets to this point. Um, it's a phenomenal condition. And I, I recommend everybody, especially before you take your certification examination, you go to either VISPO or the Wednesday slide conference where it pops up on a regular basis, and you review the histology of this. You will see nerves that are almost totally effaced by granulomatous inflammation, tremendous number of gitter cells, and fibrosis. In horses, there doesn't appear to be any uh, breed, age, or sex. Uh, predilection. It has been thought to possibly be triggered by a lot of agents including equine herpes virus types 1 and 4, uh, Halicephalobus gingivalis has been reported as a cause in one horse, uh, Sarcosystis neurona has been thought to cause or at least start this. Um, the nature of the reaction suggests uh, an immune mediated disease but uh, probably myelin is, uh, will, will cause a profound granulomatous inflammation, but this is all out of whack from what we see when we have myelin damage in the spinal cord. The signs are what you would expect um, with uh, impairment of lower motor neuron innervation in this part of the, uh, of the body. So you will see urinary bladder, paresis, rectal or anal uh, hypalgesia, uh, dilatation, and hyporeflexia of the tail and uh, perineal region. So uh, equine uh, cauda equina neuritis. I know we're at 45 minutes, but I think we can go through the common uh, ocular diseases of horses pretty quick. Um, cataracts, you can see them in old horses. Um, you can see the suture in this lens here. This could be seen in animals uh, very uncommon that have uh, high levels of sugar in their blood, diabetics, um, or can be seen just as a result of age. They're commonly associated with, with probably the most common driver of ocular disease in the horse. Um, the full-fledged syndrome is known as equine recurrent uveitis. Um, it is probably the most common cause of blindness in horses and mules and is characterized by uh, recurrent episodes of intensifying panuveitis that goes quiescent for a while. The cause of this is thought to be the antigen sharing that uh, you have between antigens of the lens and to a lesser extent the cornea as with and they're very similar to uh, antigens that are seen in various leptospires like leptospira interrogans and so if the animal is infected or even inoculated with um, some vaccines that contain this antigen over time it's thought that a autoimmune disease affects because the body thinks that uh, the 
the antigens of the lens and the cornea are foreign antigens. A binding of antibodies to the uh, lens in the cornea will reactivate complement, will initiate tissue damage, will liberate more antigens, and you can see that it is a vicious cycle. Uh, this progressive disease um, will start out as a uveitis, progress to an endophthalmitis, and eventually maybe to a phytic bulb. Damage to the lens um, may cause a uh, phacoclastic uveitis. Uh, which is, you know, obviously is going to contribute significantly to the inflammation in this eye. Um, you will often see great case in the Wednesday slides about three or four years ago. Uh, you will see amyloid production because of the tremendous amount of inflammation in the uh, uh, the iris and the ciliary body. So whenever I see an eye that has a lot going on, the first thing I'm going to think about is is this a case of equine uh, recurrent uveitis. Some fun infectious agents. Here's a horse with a worm in its eye. It could be a horse, it could be a dog, it could even be a person. And worms in the eyes are irritating. They don't cause a tremendous amount of damage if they're relegated to the outside. If you get uh, parasites inside your eye, a couple of phalarids and dogs will get inside the eye and cause some damage. Um, and certainly migration of helminths such as ascarids in, in the developing eye um, or the fully fledged retina can be a problem. But this particular one is known as Thalasia californiensis. It is a, a nematode that lives within the conjunctival sac and the lacrimal duct and it's spread from horse to horse by face flies which, which sort of uh, feed on the secretions from the eyes and um, it migrates from the mouth parts of the fly into the uh, uh, conjunctival sac and it will uh, uh, will mature, lay larva, which the next fly comes along. So uh, that is uh, that is the Lasia californiensis. Don't forget about the uh, non-pigmented or hyperpigmented lesions around the iris that you will see with Oncocerca cervicalis. Those, that's the filaria parasite, which will occasionally get inside the eye and cause a, a not an insignificant uveitis. Oh my God, ulcers. Ulcers in a horse eye. They often follow antibiotic and steroid uses, and if you look closely, you will often find fungi within them. This is a melting ulcer and they are just the most terrible thing to have to treat. They're much better for pathologists because we just have to cut them in half and stain them and look for fungal. But remember the horse lives in uh, in the barn where you always have hay and and fungi are ubiquitous in the horse's environment. They're often uh, just normal contaminants of the conjunctival sac and if you are giving steroids or anything to a horse's eye that will weaken the protective mechanism of the cornea, you facilitate the invasion of the uh, uh, fungus in the eye. This is a fantastic cytology of a horse's eye from Dr. Don Mutin. And if you ever have see a picture of this beautiful, please send it to me. You can even see the fruiting bodies. This was this was a conjunctival or corneal scrape from a horse. So. Uh, melting ulcers of the horse eye, you always want to look for fungus in them. If you have a ulcerated area of the eyelids or the third eyelid of a horse with a white face, you want to think about squamous cell carcinoma. It's the most common neoplasm of the eye in the horse, in cattle, in anything with a white face. Um, and they are usually induced by ultraviolet light, which induces neoplasia in the skin and in the conjunctiva um, through formation of pyrimidine dimers in DNA. And uh, if the animal has deficient nucleotide excision repair, then you are going to end up with a squamous cell carcinoma. Not all of these, um, they usually start out as plaques. They, not, they don't all the time go to uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes the body will heal um, them from the precancerous stage, but they go through sort of a papilloma to a uh, 
to a carcinoma in situ to fully fledged squamous cell carcinoma over months to years. About to spontaneous regression happens in about 30 to 50 percent of these. So if you're seeing this roughening of the third eyelid in a horse with a, a white face or largely white face, you don't think about squamous cell carcinoma, and you certainly want to don't want to let it get to uh, to this stage. Early identification uh, and excision and treatment of this is available at veterinary schools, and and hopefully most people will take advantage of that. And then I want to finish up with this particular picture. When I first saw it, I said, "What's well, it's a dog? It is." a uh, orbital meningioma, but it turned out this is a horse eye, and this neoplasm, uh, which has a triangular shape surrounding the optic nerve, turned out to be lymphoma. So that was a new one on me, but you can see ocular, periocular lymphoma in horses as well. Well, okay, we got the whole thing in before an hour. It's only 55 minutes. Uh, congratulations to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope you come back uh, often to the foundation's YouTube channel or Facebook page, but they tend to move fairly quickly because we're always putting new stuff on there and it gets pushed down. But you can always find all of these lectures on horses or other species or uh, gross pathology of various organ systems on the foundation's YouTube channel or the Joint Pathology Center's uh, video library. So I hope you come back often. I hope you enjoy them as much as I enjoy putting them out. Uh, we're running out of lectures on the uh, horse. We'll be moving on and finishing up with the reproductive system and the respiratory system, and finally the urinary system in our next couple of lectures. So I hope you come back for that, and then after that, we're going to go on and do a little more in-depth gross pathology of the nervous system. That's sort of a short lecture series because there's not a lot of great gross pathology within the nervous system. I want to cover that as, a, uh, as an organ system, and I hope you'll be coming back for those. With that, I'm going to wish you a very happy holiday, so I hope you're enjoying them with fantastic health, and that the rest of your day has been as great as the beginning of mine. Take care now.